One, two, one, two. <clears throat>
everybody. If you will, let's stand together. You know, tomorrow's Veterans Day, so we're going to try to have a patriotic service, so what, tonight with the song, so uh, you sing out tonight, all right? Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the many where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Thank you so much, Lord, and we do ask you, Lord, to bless our country. Ask you, Lord, to take care of us, and Lord, may we continue to remember those veterans, that many that gave their life and many sacrificed so much, Lord, for us to remain free. Father, tonight we thank you, Lord, though, for the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. I pray, God, now you give us a good service tonight. Lord, you'd bless the singing, you'd bless the preaching of God's Word and our fellowship together. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. amen. You may be seated. Amen. Good to see you tonight. And um, it's hard to believe tomorrow is Veterans Day. And uh, just everything keeps moving right along thanksgiving christmas and uh 20 what's the next year 2022 yeah be here before you know it <laughs> all right um we got some butterflies back there um if you still want to use some of those uh, to go in the boxes remember they've got to be here by this sunday i know a lot of them's already out there and folks already took care of that and we appreciate it and uh, miss earlene will get them and send them off don't forget Sunday night, uh, the Warrens are going to be with us. Looking forward to them being with us uh, Sunday night in our evening service. Um, let's see, we've got a missionary letter from Brother Reitman and uh, the uh, Habith Messiah Ministries. And um, most of all of you know Brother Reitman. He says October was another very busy month. From Illinois to Georgia to Minnesota to New Mexico to Colorado. Many times people come to me overwhelmed, uh, having learned things they never had before considered. One by one, these very faithful believers are being challenged to learn how to be an effective witness to the Jewish people they come in contact with. Uh, this is what keeps us schlepping. I can hear him saying it. He's 
schlepping across the country preaching. My greatest desire is to transfer the burden of my heart to your hearts. The task is greater than we are. We cannot possibly be everywhere at once. Therefore, the more we see the Lord capturing the hearts of pastors and church members for the task, the greater potential my people will have of receiving a credible gospel witness. Our track outreach continues to move forward. As you know, we have sent our track to every Jewish family in the Metroplex um, and are now sending it to Jewish homes in Houston. Uh, two of the responses last month were as follows. To the Reitmans, you are sadly misguided. <laughs> the next one says, please remove me from your mailing list. I died 20 years ago. He says, when we receive these types of responses, we know the word was read. Please pray we will see many returning the response card, giving us the opportunity to uh, build that witness. Michelle and I remain grateful for your faithful prayer and financial support. We know that apart from you, our ministry could not be possible. Please always remember that it, it is by your mercy they shall obtain mercy. Brother Al Reitman. So uh, keep him and Michelle in prayer and that ministry uh, wits into the to the Jewish people. And uh, Brother Al um, is all, anytime we've had him here, um, we always enjoy him. He is definitely a, a character, even when we have to move the pulpit. At least you don't have to move the pulpit for me. You know, I, you know, I can keep it up here. All right, Matthew chapter 7, yeah. right? Matthew chapter 7, if you'll take your Bibles and turn there. And we'll take up Wednesday night offering. Lord, we thank you again for letting us be in your house tonight. We ask you, Lord, to again bless your word. Bless the offering as we receive it. And Lord, just pray that you'd uh, help us to use it wisely. And uh, Lord, may honor you above everything. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Thank you, Sharon. I, I appreciate uh, them putting together a patriotic service very quickly tonight. Preacher said his sermon now is going to be Sunday, but uh, they put something together tonight. And the hardest songs in the world to sing is Christmas songs and patriotic songs. Amen? But let's stand together, if you will. And we're going to sing an old song, My Country Tis of Thee. much planning, but I'm going to try to sing one for you tonight, kind of a talk-like song, but it's uh, got a good message to it, and I'm going to try it, may mess it up, but I'm going to try it tonight for you. God bless America again. Amen. We need him back. God bless America again. You must know the trouble that she's in. Wash her pretty face and dry her eyes and then God bless America again. You know I wish God would bless America again. Like he did way back there when it all began. He blessed her then and we sort of took it for granted. We didn't ask again. So let's just hold her hand. Now that's all. In case she stumbles, let's don't let her fall. God bless America. You must know the trouble that she's in. Oh, wash her pretty face and dry her eyes and then God bless America again. I don't understand everything that I read and what I hear about what's wrong with America. But when you don't know a whole lot, 
book learning and there's many things that I don't understand. But I know this much, she's like a mother to me and I love her with all my heart. And let me tell you this folks, everything I am and ever hope to be, I owe to God and her. God bless America again. You must know the trouble that she's in. Oh, wash her pretty face and dry her eyes again. God bless America again. God bless America again. That's what we need. Amen. That's that's an old trick. They don't got a new one now. You you pull the head out of the rabbit. That's a trick. <laughs> All right. Well, amen. Amen. Well, it seems like I've been here today once before. I do want to thank everybody that was able to make the services for Brother Stanley. Uh, we were kind of uh, determined not to make it a funeral more or less but a celebration for a life and a job well done Matthew chapter 7 is where we're going to start and we're going to read verse 15 through 20 And this is not a, not a patriotic sermon by any uh, stretch of the imagination, I thought. Being tomorrow, with Veterans Day coming in the middle of the week and everything, you, know, you don't know whether to uh, do it on Wednesday or do it on Sunday, and I uh, decided to do my part anyway on Sunday, so that'll be Lord willing now. And I've never been real big on preaching certain sermons for certain holidays or things anything like that because uh, I, I, sometimes you get it all ready and God changes it and it's really aggravating when he does that <laughs> but but uh, so did what You know, the Bible says a nagging wife is like a dripping roof, you know. <laughs> well, let's see if we can get through this. Chapter verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. The word ravening means hungry. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistle? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. 
How many of you ever, have ever read or heard of the story of Little Red Riding Hood? Uh, Little Red Riding Hood. Well, of course it's a good children's story, but in reality it really has some good truths uh, contained in it if you look at it with, from that slant. Uh, especially at the end of the story where the wolf that's all dressed up in Granny's robe and Granny's cap it tried to eat Little Red Riding Hood. And uh, he said, I just can't help it. I'm a wolf. I just can't help it. Wolves are natural predators. And the wolf's goal is to devour whatever it possibly can, whether it's pigs in straw houses or whether it's little girls in red clothing. It makes no difference to him. Now, if the wolf is at your door, then you ought to understand that's bad news. That's bad news, you see. No one is going to see a snarling wolf at the door and think, oh, what a cute little puppy. I think I'll play with him for a while. But the truth is the most dangerous wolf would be the wolf that tries to disguise himself, see? And Scripture has a lot to say, really, about wolves, and none of it's ever good. I guess, evidently, there's no good wolves. They're treacherous, they're dangerous, and uh, when they are presented in God's Word, they are always presented in a negative way. So consequently, uh, Jesus says here, beware. Not be aware, but beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The word beware literally means to watch out, look out, you see and uh, this warning takes place, uh, this scripture, it's kind of ironic really in one sense of the word, it, it takes place right after Jesus describes the two ways of life. One that leads to eternal life and then the other that leads to death and destruction. And it's in that context that Jesus just starts off on this, beware of false prophets. So, Number one, I think that we ought to heed Jesus' warning and that we ought to watch out. We ought to look out, you see. I, I'm sure sometimes you've been to a ball game. I know I've been to several of them that, uh, that when a foul ball was hit and, and it come up into the stands, every, someone was going to yell out, heads up. That's what Jesus is doing, see. Now, if they yelled heads up and you weren't paying attention, there was a pretty good chance that you were going to get clocked in the head with a foul ball. And nobody, though, that says heads up, they don't say heads up. They holler it. They scream it out. Look out, heads up. The words are spoken loudly because it's a warning. And we need to take these words of Jesus seriously because it's a warning to us, my friend. Because it's so easy. And I think it has seemingly to me anyway, and maybe I'm just different, but it seems to me like the uh, on the road to life that it's... Uh, it's gotten a lot easier to get lulled into complacency. You know, there are so many things out there that demand your attention. And sometimes we're not real good at ordering these things, at lining them up and, and getting first things first and keeping first things first. 
And in doing this, sometimes we get confused, and then sometimes we just get complacent and lose sight of the fact that we need to be alert. We need to be on the lookout because the devil is seeking to turn us aside to, and, and to, to backslide on our faith uh, unless we are alert and look out and look, watch out for what's taking place. Most every one of us have, I believe, at one time have known someone that at one time or other, they were dedicated to the Lord and they were following him as they ought to. They were serving the Lord because they loved him and they wanted to, to serve him and to be uh, used of him. And they, they came to church and they considered the church as their a family extension. It was just like part of their family. They were involved in what was going on, what was taking place, and all the activities and the opportunities to do something for the Lord. But something sidetracked them. And then you look up, where are they? Where are they? See? See? They're, they're not. They can't be found. You, you know anybody like that? I've known, I've known several that way over the years. That you thought they were really going to, to be useful in the kingdom of God. You thought they were really going to be, you were going to be able uh, to help them to grow and to become active and used by the, by the Lord. But something happened. Something happened. And first thing you know, they disappear. And you don't hear about them anymore. Probably most all of us know somebody, if you've been in church very long, you know somebody that fits that bill. What happened to them? What caused them to do that? There were so many things that could have possibly caused something like that to happen. Maybe they started listening to some of the TV preachers. See, some of this junk that you see on TV that is so disparaging and so disappointing. I mean, it just uh, it just breaks your heart to see a a coliseum or something filled with people and and somebody that is, is, if you listen to them, you can tell that they're not telling the truth. You can tell that they're not telling the people the truth, you see. Or maybe they run across a disgruntled brother or sister that was not completely satisfied with what was going on at the church and you know, misery loves company. Or maybe they didn't get enough attention. You know, people like attention. People like to hear their names. And that's bad with some of us because I can't remember your name. <laughs> <laughs> but people like to hear that. But they like to be recognized. They like attention. You know, I don't know, probably... Forty years ago now, probably somewhere around there, maybe 45 years ago, we had a fellow in the church. He got mad at us because he wasn't called on to pray enough. And he went down and joined another church. Now, maybe Satan got into their life and, uh, uh, and caused them to become dissatisfied or something. But the truth of the whole matter when it comes down is they stopped watching. They stopped watching out. They stopped being alert. My friend, you need to realize today the devil is not your friend. You need to understand that he's not your friend. And anything he can do to get you upset, 
with the preaching service or the song service or the anything else service or whatever else that will get you dissatisfied. And then when you get dissatisfied, you're going to help your best friend to get dissatisfied. And the first thing you know, all of it out of church. Out of church. Over petty little things. Petty little things. I like that, <coughs> that song that used to was going around, you know, about excuses, excuses. You hear them every day. And one verse there says, he, he didn't even shake my hand. Well, you know, maybe he didn't see you. See, you know, people today got so much on your mind, sometimes you walk right by somebody and not see them. You know, you didn't intend to do it, but you did it. And then first thing you know, they're mad at you because you didn't shake their hand. Listen, we don't stay on the straight and the narrow by accident. It doesn't just happen. It takes effort. It takes patience. It takes maturity. And if you don't work at those things, then you're not going to stay on the straight and narrow. The first... <clears throat> you know, when we first got saved, Gloria and I, 100 years ago, both of us were virtually Bible ignorant. She had been to church more than I had. Uh, uh, I thought everybody at church was a hypocrite, and I didn't want to go. But what we did, though, we, we didn't understand that there are different churches and churches are different, and there's different doctrines, different teachings and things. So if, if we heard a, somebody was having a revival within 50 or 75 miles away, we'd jump in the car and run to it. We didn't care whether they were Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, Pentecostal, Seventh-day Adventist, or whatever. And we got exposed to that. It's just a miracle, really. God had to be in it that we didn't get mixed up. Now, a lot of times when people first get saved, they're so anxious to learn something, they'll just grab the first worm that comes by. You got to be alert. You got to watch out. See, you got to watch out. We stay on, on, the, on the straight and the narrow by following the leadership of the Holy Spirit and staying in his word. Staying in this word. This word, my friend, is your nutrition. It's what helps you grow. And I believe that's why Jesus says, watch out. Heads up. You see? Because there's somebody out there or something out there that's going to try to lead you off of the right path. And it's so happens so often today. You can get in the wrong crowd and be led astray. Let me ask you a question. If I should ask you, what do you think is the most important and probably the most dangerous priority of a shepherd. What would you think was the most important and probably the most dangerous priority of a shepherd? You know, to me, the greatest priority that a shepherd has to his flock is to make sure that they are protected. Because, see, if it, it is that me? <laughs> I 
I'm not backing up. I ain't, you know, I'm... <laughs> Something beeped. I don't know. Is that, was that you, Miss Sandra? <laughs> no, it wasn't you. Oh. I thought somebody planted a bomb up here, you know. <laughs> If a shepherd, no matter if a shepherd takes them to where the greenest grass is, and they eat that green, green grass until their little tummies are just bulging out, and he takes them where the coolest, sweetest water is, and they just drink that sweet, cool water to their fill. But yet, somewhere along the line there, a wolf comes in and eats him, what good was the water in the grass? <laughs> He's just going to die a fat, full sheep. That's all. <laughs> the most important thing is to protect him. Take care of him. Watch out for him. See? You, you know what, do you know what a, a, a true shepherd does for his, uh, his sheep at night? What he does is he gathers up a bunch of of limbs or thorny branches or whatever, and he builds usually a circular sheepfold. Usually it's a circular one. And it's enclosed on every side of it. But at one place in there, he leaves an opening for a lot where the sheep can come in and go out. And then he goes, he walks into that sheepfold and he calls his sheep and they come in there and when they're all in, you know what he does? He goes where that opening is and lays down. He lays down there. That's where he sleeps. See, what's he doing? He's protecting those sheep. See, he's if a wolf shows up, snarling and foaming at the mouth it's his duty to stand between that wolf and those sheep see that's his duty it's a dangerous duty but that's his duty see that's a dangerous thing to have to do but that's what he has to do but Jesus gives us an even more dangerous situation. See, what if that wolf disguises himself and slips in among those sheep unbeknown? What if the wolf, what if the shepherd doesn't catch him? See, maybe this wolf is a smart wolf. Maybe he's covered himself with, with some fleece from a, one of his previous kills. And he's disguised himself now as a sheep. He walks like a sheep. He acts like a sheep. He even smells like a sheep. And no one suspects that he's a wolf until it's too late and he has done devoured one of the shepherd's precious little sheep See, that's why Jesus says look out watch out see that's why he warned us that way you know Paul knew that this would be one of the greatest dangers for a shepherd Acts chapter 20, verse number 29 through 31. He's been in Ephesus now for three years. He's been there with those people for a long time, and so naturally he's going to love them, you know. You know, uh, a shepherd learns to love his sheep. He loves them. Doesn't want anything to happen to them. And here's what he says, because he knows he's fixing to leave. For this, I, for I know this, 
that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And then he says something startling in one sense of the word. He says, also of your own selves shall men arise out of your own sheepfold. I guess there are some rebellious sheep. See, out of your own sheepfold, he said, shall, uh, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. In other words, it's, there's going to be people in the sheepfold, in the congregation that are going to arise and try to get people to follow them. He says, therefore, watch. Therefore, watch. You think he got that from Jesus? Therefore, watch. And remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. See? He's warning these people. Be on your guard. Watch out. I won't be there to protect you. Wolves are going to try to move in. And some of your own people are going to rise up and try to get people to follow them. They're going to devour the young ones. Watch. Watch. Turn over to 2 Peter, chapter 2. Peter tells us virtually the same thing. Virtually the same thing. 2 Peter, chapter 2. But Peter, see, kind of advises shepherds how to identify what, uh, wolves among the flock. Second Peter chapter 2, look at, let's start at verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious or evil ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Peter's saying there's going to wolves come in and introduce divisive things among you secretly. Secretly, say. Whenever you start to examine the fruit that comes from some people's lives, especially the, if they are in the false prophet category, it'll always be poisonous and destructive, but in the end it's going to be deadly. See? I'm going to tell you, if what you listen to doesn't create a, a sweet spirit, and a purpose of, of truth, my friend, then you need to not listen to it. You see, these false wolves, these uh, false prophets and these wolves that Peter's talking about here, they come in and they prey on the, on the weak. You know, it's, a, it's a, just a statement of fact that some Christians are stronger than other Christians. Some Christians are weaker than other Christians. Some Christians are easy to lead astray. Because one thing is, 
we try to teach people, you know, that you ought to love people, and in loving people, you, you have a tendency to trust people. But you've got to be careful, see, because otherwise there are so many gullible Christians, gullible Christians, that'll just snap up anything, like guppies, you know, little. We used to play Pac-Man, you know. <laughs> and they'll just snap up anything. You know, if they they hear a person, if if a person reads out of the Bible, they they think he's a good fellow. Has to be a good fellow because he's reading out of the Bible. He's reading out of the King James Bible. Got to be a good fellow. He may not be. You know, he may not be. The spiritually immature, the gullible, and the weak, my friend, are his prey. John says in, in 1 John chapter 1, it says, Then this is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in the darkness, we lie and do not know the truth. We are supposed to be children of the light, not children of the darkness. We're supposed to, my friend, be able to shine the light of God's love on these false prophets and wolves and identify them and know who they are. But you know what most people do? They depend on me to do it for you, David to do it for you, Jerry to do it for you. You're supposed to be watching. You're supposed to be looking out. You're supposed to be heads up. See, because if you're not, that wolf will knock on your door. You see, wolves in sheep clothing are very, very misleading. You see, because they can claim all kind of things. They can claim that they're walking in fellowship with God. They can, uh, they can claim that they're walking in the light all they want to. But they're not. And most of the time, this is going to happen secretly and privately. They won't come in and, and, and start and say anything, you know, well, you know, I don't believe everything in the Bible is true. They're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. They're not going to come right out and say, well, I don't believe that Jesus is the only way. They're not going to do that. See? It's just not going to happen. In the early church, as well as today, these wolves sneak in and try to devour the weak and the immature and the gullible sheep by denying the sovereignty of Christ, that he is the only way and he does have all power in heaven and earth. Peter tells them in uh, verse 17 of, of the second chapter there, that their wells without water, clouds that are carried with tempest, to, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever, driven by a storm. One of the ways that God tells us that we can recognize these sheep, these false prophets, these wolves, these false prophets, is by the fruits that they bear, see? I want you to think about about seven things here, six or seven little things real quickly, some questions that you ought to ask when you're confronted by spiritual false teaching. Is Where does that message come from? Is it from God's word or is it from some extracurricular piece of literature? Does it come from God's word, God's inspired and errant word, or is it something somebody, some theologian said somewhere? Say, clearly invented stories. You know, I was, <laughs> I just can't believe really some of the things that take place, it just defies my imagination, uh, I was watching, there wasn't no ball game on, so I was watching 
uh, happened to happen upon it. This Sid something or another, I forget who, but I can't think of his whole name now. He's a nut. Uh, but this evangelist was telling him about how many people he had raised from the dead. And about a lady that come up on the platform and had a big old tumor on her leg. And he prayed for and touched her on the, foot, on the forehead, and that tumor just fell off and rolled down the aisle. <laughs> Where do these people come from that believe that stuff? See, I'd like to be a traveling salesman because I could sell them anything I had. What's the substance of the message? You need to, you need to ask that. Is it, is it Christ central or is it divisive and unedifying? See, what's the message sent to, uh, supposed to do? What are we supposed to garner out of it? What are we supposed to learn by it? What is this supposed to teach us? If I listen to this message, where is it going to take me? See? Is it going to draw me closer to Christ? Or is it going to drive me away from him and his church? What kind of disciples does this message produce? Good fruit or bad fruit? Good trees or bad trees? Bad trees are poison fruit. You need to understand these questions and ask these questions. Where does this message ultimately going to take me? Is it going to make me more like Christ-like? Am I going to be help me to grow in Jesus? Or is it going to take me to a place where one day I'm going to hear him say, Depart from me, I never knew you. See? God's message is so that we can be transformed in the image of his son. That's God's ultimate goal for us. And any teaching that doesn't do that is false teaching and comes from a teacher with ungodly motives. Every one of us have seen preachers that promise health and wealth if you just send me a thousand dollar check as your seed of faith you know they're real big on this seed stuff you know as if they're special prophets that can deliver the promises of God as long as that thousand dollar check gets there See? that's what Peter says Peter says that uh, through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you I don't know about you, but I believe there's a special place in hell for these false teachers that live in $40 million mansions and travel in $10 million Gulfstream jets that are all paid for by the, the grieving parents of some dying child somewhere. And they use Jesus as a sales pitch see but you know what Peter says there in the third verse there he says this their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping listen now I tell you right now they're going to pay for what they done Jesus says watch out for those that would promise you the ability to buy God's favor. God's favor is not for sale. You can't buy it. It's just not for sale. This is straight talk by Jesus. Be aware. Beware. Beware of false prophets. Be aware of wolves, you see. Jesus, that's straight talk from him. Good, tree, good trees, he says, bears good fruit. Bad trees bear 
bad fruit. And if the tree doesn't bear good fruit, he said it'll be cut down and thrown in the fire. Become a tree inspector, a fruit inspector. And look and see what these false people, false teachers and prophets are peddling. And be careful. Be careful. Don't swallow every hook that's dropped in the water. Because a lot of them have a bad worm on it. And a lot of God's people get caught up in it. When we've been amply warned, amply warned throughout the scripture that they're there. They're there. And you need to be scripturally taught enough to be able to recognize them for what they are. There's no excuse to get caught up in some of these cults and things that take place in the name of religion. If you watch and beware and keep your eyes open, you won't get caught up in them. Everybody has an unspoken...